All right. We welcome everybody to um, this year's advanced kingdom conversation. Um, sorry, I'm having some things here. And um, the previous years has been wonderful. 2018, when we first got started, 2019, we followed up. It was intense. 2020, in terms of, um, uh, I think, the, the, the COVID pandemic, we still did. And we ran for uh, three consecutive uh, nights and, I think, a weekend um, every Saturday um, for three good weeks with various speakers. And it was so wonderful, intense and rich. And um, 2021, we didn't step into this at all. Several things were happening around us. But um, just a very brief introduction to what Northgate is about. Uh, right, you see collaboration, you see breakthrough, you see convergence. Um, collaboration because we believe in the spirit of partnership, that in our partnership uh, with the Lord, with the Holy Spirit, with one another, that joining, that co-mingling of strength um, allows our weakness to dissipate and to allow the Lord to work through us that ordinary men begin to do extraordinary things to achieve things. And interestingly, this year, uh, 2022 AKC, we are looking at partnership. And um, I, I, I never intend to speak or do any brief introduction on the subject because I want to give all the speakers the opportunity to to speak to us based on the energy of the spirit um, in their hearts as the spirit of the Lord moves them. So uh, Northgate is just uh, a hope um, for mobilization, for activation. Uh, we seek to, to walk in a release of the pure strand of the apostolic um, grace uh, in the earth. And we believe that through the partnership, we can have breakthrough and ultimately, Converging Christ, that is where we are looking at. And so if our focus is on ourselves, then we are not going to succeed. If I'm going to be looking at the fault of my brother, there is no way I'll be able to enter into the inheritance, what the Bible called the inheritance of the saints, lock, uh, the inheritance that is locked in the saints. There's so much that I believe God wants to bring forth through uh, one another. So that is just by way to simply say welcome. and. Um, like I said, this year is about partnership. Now, the advanced kingdom conversation is always tilted towards business professionals and marketplace uh, executives. This year, we didn't do the normal registration we do for people to register. We know the numbers that are pending. We, we do the necessary adjustment. We just left it open um, to see the responsiveness and all. And so it's, a, it's, for, it's for marketplace executives and believers. It's for church leaders, apostles, evangelists, prophets, and all. It's for church administrators. It is a place where we come to uh, provoke one another and to walk in the grace of God for us. Now, there's um, a couple of things I want to say about partnership. Then um, we invite our guest for this evening to speak to us. With um, partnership, we can look at it from different, different, different levels. We can look at, apost at a apostolic partnership. We can look at the marriage partnership. We can look at the partnership between God and man. There are things that God can never do until we position ourselves well and make ourselves available because of the level of authorization and the permission he has given man in the earth. And it's so dear to God. God is seeking that partnership. He is searching it out. He is reaching it out. For example, in the book of Isaiah, he said that to, to this I will look. He says, where is the house that you have built for me? There is some a seeking of the Lord to sit among and settle among men and settle among men. A thing that is of divine origin, finding a settling among men and to find expression. And so um, there is a need that the body of Christ individually, we begin to position ourselves right. Secondly, there is something that I believe if we do not cure ourselves of 
uh, will endanger our partnership, will delve the edge of our sphere. Our frontier will be continually broken. We cannot step into the capacity God wants us to walk in um, as a group, as a community, as the entire body of Christ. The Bible says that henceforth we regard no man according to the flesh. Henceforth we regard no man according to the flesh. Our partnership begins way, way, way before our physical and outer manifestation of it. It begins way in Christ. We are one in Christ. And if that revelation can, can grip our hearts and, and stay within our focus, it changes the way we begin to function in the earth. And secondly, how do I perceive my brother? How do I regard him? Do I carry him with a heart of honor, even in my private moment? It's very important because that will shape the, the topology of the spirit. That will shape the, shape, shape the atmosphere of the spirit around us. That Dave, for example, Dave Cropper, I've never met Dave Cropper in, in, in physical, in any physical space. But we have a certain regard for one another. We have a certain holding for one another in our hearts. That even if um, I do not speak with Dave for weeks and months, there is a certain honor with which I carry him as, as uh, respecting and receiving him as God's elect in a certain space that God has allowed him to walk in. And that allows me to try. That allows me to try. And on, on lastly, I was listening to, there are two stories that pops up in my mind. I was listening to, um, a great man of the one of them is in Australia, and he got into a very strong relational dynamics with another apostle in the U.S. And so, on this occasion, in his community in Australia, he was announcing to the community the new relationship that he has gotten into, and then he mentioned the apostle's name and began to talk about the role this apostle is playing in his life. He said they recorded on that the miracles that he personally for how many years in ministry has never walked in before. And those miracles, those particular miracles were miracles that denote the ministry or characterize the ministry and the flow of that apostle who is now late in, in the States. So there is a way that there is an inheritance in the saints that God wants to symbolically bless one another with and to allow his purpose to gain momentum and acceleration in the earth. The body, uh, ministries, um, um, servants of God, apostles and all desires to see kingdom partners. We desire to see ministry partners, desire to see ministries of help. Um, um, uh, Moses was one that needed a partnership with all the level of anointing he had and carried. He needed partnership to succeed. When Aaron and her had to hold his hand up, that help we can call partnership. So let's get into uh, 2022 AKC uh, partnership and uh, let's allow God to speak to our hearts. I, I would, I would enjoin you to look at things from very fresh perspective. Set at theirs um, your own ideas what you have known already, what you have believed, what you have walked in and what you have preached if you are a preacher. Just set it at advanced. Step into this. Just require of yourself that I want to see things with fresh eyes and let God do a work in my heart. So with great honor, we want to um, get into this. So let's talk about Dave and then we get him to speak to us. Dave, um, uh, Dave Cropper, full name, born in Trinidad, uh, born in the Twin Island of uh, Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, located in the Caribbean region. The proper is a global voice of transformation and restoration. When our graphic artist was working on your profile, he said he doesn't understand why we're now going to be writing Imagine Voice. So he says it's a global voice and indeed they carries a certain unique capacity, apostolic trust that sits, sits within uh, his prophetic expression. So let's talk about it. Uh, uh, a global voice of transformation and restoration, raised by God to the, for the marketplace ministry. His prophetic gift finds expression both in the corporate setting within the body and within the body of Christ. 
since responding to his call to ministry in 1994, he has been well received across nations in the areas of prophetic preaching, biblical teaching, leadership training, and business um, consulting. Dave has spent most of his adult life as a successful entrepreneur. That guy you see, he is a man of the cameras. He is the man of, of arts. Um, he's an academically trained in media and communications and holds a master's degree in business administration, specializing in strategy from the Angelia Ruskin University in the UK. In 2016, he co-founded Biblical Learning Series, uh, a Bible teaching center where they serve as one of the core facilitators. Today, he functions as one of the uh, leading architects of Interface Global, a uh, kingdom enterprise and relational orbit for ministries, people development, and nations building initiatives. Dave is married to Dr. Marisa Cropper with three wonderful children and his golf and a bag of golf clubs. Dave, um, let's have you um, take over and let's enjoy and see with fresh eyes the things God have done. So God bless you all. Over to you, Dave. Well, good day to everyone. It's a deed of pleasure to be here. Mark, are you seeing my screen? Yes, sir, I do. You do. Good, 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 good. It's been a while since we, um, we've actually done an initiative together. And, um, you know, the, these events are no small things. We regard these as as critical moments in that which heaven is doing. I believe that God has raised you up to be a pivotal man in his time to pull together voices, to pull together uh, seeds of the kingdom that need to be sown in different parts of the earth. And um, my assignment today is to do such a thing, to, to, to release that which God has been sharing and downloading and, and just comforting my heart with and that which we are involved with. So you're going to see Gate 24. Gate 24 is an initiative that speaks to partnership at a very uh, fundamental level in the, in the area of prayer and in the area of fellowship. And it is not, um, this is not a work of theory. This is that which is actual, real, and happening <laughs> even as we speak. Um, there are, so many aspects of partnership that we could speak to. And um, I'd like to start by just laying a foundation for that which I believe is not just relevant for what's happening with, in, in our world, but it's happening across the world. And I want to start by just, just doing some scripture reading because it's going to properly set the context for understanding exactly why um, uh, partnership is a critical part of what God is doing in this time. So let's look at Acts chapter 11. We're going to just do a lot of reading right now. We just, just relax and just sit back and just enjoy the reading of the radio voice, Dave. <laughs> and, um, and let's see if we could glean some principles here that speak to what I believe God is sharing in this hour. So Acts 11, chapter 1. Let's go. I'm reading from the, let me do the new, new King James. Let me make the language a little more friendly <laughs> and a little more palatable. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Now this is no small issue. This is the church moving into a whole new season where what was originally thought to be for the Jews only, God basically establish a whole new order and said, listen, the Gentiles need to receive the word of God too. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained it to them in the order of the beginning and said, I was in the city of Joppa praying 
Everybody say pray. <laughs> Hallelujah. And in a trance, I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals and of the earth, wild bees, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, No, Lord. <laughs> Not so. For nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. So, so Peter is standing on the integrity of his religious practice. <laughs> you know, these are the ordinances handed down from the forefathers, and I am adhering to it. This is Peter giving God a theology lesson right here. But the voice answered me again from heaven. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. For this was done three times. Everybody say three times. And all were drawn up again unto heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was having been sent to me from Caesarea. So the first thing I want us to identify here is that here is Peter. He's in prayer. And he has this trance. He has this, this spiritual encounter. And the Lord speaks to him. And what was about to take place is that the gospel is transitioning from being localized among the Jewish people and it was beginning to gain access. It was beginning to gain acceptance into the Gentile world. Now, we know that the intent of Jesus from the beginning was to go into all of the world, all of the world, and preach the gospel of the kingdom. This was the original mandate. It was the original intent. It was always in the mind of the Lord that this gospel go far and wide. It did not be contained to a, a limited core, a limited bunch. But the expanse that was connected to this word had the ability to transform the whole earth. And the intent to ensure that this happened, this is what we are navigating in this time. Let me just ask a question. Is this being recorded, Mark? Can you? ascertain whether the record button was enabled yes yes okay good so we are here and and here is here is peter and god brought him into a space he brought him into an experience because peter stood at a pivotal role of leadership within the church at this time and what rested on peter's life what rested in what was seeded into who peter was from his walk with the lord it was critical now that Peter led the charge in pushing the gospel into new frontiers, establishing it into new, into new places. But his internal configuration needed an adjustment, and God had to visit him in order to make this possible. Now, Acts 11.11. 11. At that very moment, three men stood before the house where he was, having been sent from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me, go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in a house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who said him as Peter. So there's something that has taken place and regulated in the realm of the Spirit. Things are being ordered spiritually. Angels operating on one side. Men being sent on the other side. The Holy Spirit talking. Right? And in 14, he says, Who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved? As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as upon us at the beginning. So something happened. The assignment shifted out of what started in the, from the day of Pentecost. It's now happening in another environment. And as he's speaking, this is God by his own choice that decides by his own decision, I am going to fall upon them. And this is, this is amazing. 
Then I remember the word of the Lord, verse 16. How he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave the same gift as he gave us when he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, these things, these things, they became silent. And they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Now I want to talk about just how important this is to us and, and how this is impacting on our lives even to this very day. There is a church that's alive in Ghana. There is a church that's alive in Trinidad. That's not Jews. I'm not a Jew. Mark, I don't know. Are, are you a Jew? I'm, I'm not too sure. But across the earth, what started as a movement, as a contained move, by the evidence of the Spirit of God falling upon these men, as Peter spoke, God's intent was made clear that he also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And I'm going to look at what happened from this point, because what happens from this point is critical in our understanding as to how the church began to function and what changed the way in which the church functioned and what influenced their ability to operate in certain ways from this point. Let's continue reading. We don't have much to go before I begin to get into this thing. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. You see, that's the problem right there. What God intended to break forth to all nations just remained among the Jews only. You know, but you know, really can't contain the spirit of God, right? So the good news starts to arise in, in, in verse 20. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. <clears throat> and a great number believed and turned to the Lord, a great number. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen, everybody said seen, the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year, a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. At the, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And we understand that this term has gone from, <laughs> from length to length. It has gone from one expression to another. It takes on so many different meanings and so many different applications of what it means to be a Christian. The hands of what was known as Christianity today has been stewarded and, and fathered by many different dispensations and many different persuasions and, and leadings. And the Spirit of God has navigated through all of these dispensations that which still constitutes what is known as the people of God in the earth today. So things that I get a little excited here. Verse 27. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Prophets. Everybody say prophets. Prophets. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. 
which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Now, I want to begin my discourse right here. Then the disciples, according to his ability, not coerced or begged by a pastor to insist on a seed offering, they determined to send relief to the brethren. There was something that was real that began to happen in the hearts of the disciples that identified their lives as being connected to the lives of the other brethren dwelling in Judea. There is an interconnectedness. There's a partnership that began to arise that was determined according to his own ability. This was not coerced by any singular man. This was not instructed as any particular doctrine. This thing was a move of the spirit that speaks to something that I see emerging in the church in this hour that I call that which is among the churches. And I'm going to be rehearsing that phrase for the entire of 2023 as God gives me grace. Because that which is done in our church needs to begin to break out and operate and become operationalized in a context that I call among the churches. It was according to his own ability. In verse 30, this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. The church has entered a whole new season. They have moved from expressions of koinonia and they are now taking on dimensions of partnership in sustainability. Now, this was caused by a famine. This was caused by adversity. The new dimensions that the church began to operate in. When Stephen was sent, it was to administer aid and help to the other brethren. This core function was triggered and activated once again in this famine. And what it did is that it saw that what represented the kingdom of God, the family of God in the earth, now had a component that moved from spiritual gatherings and meetings to now practical dimensions of my life touching your life. Of that which concerns me begins to be con concerning you. The church became operationalized in a whole new way and it allowed them to function by the hands of the apostles to facilitate aid one to the other. The realm of the spirit by this time must have been ravaging because the expanse of the word of God, the good news of the gospel, has broken out into, into Gentile territory. And that thing was no small thing to the kingdom of God. For it to move from a Jewish expression, and Jesus was a guy from Palestine, he, you, know, you know, this is this thing that happened among the Jews, to this thing being an expression that had one mandate in it go to the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth, the ends of the earth nature of the mandate that Christ released was beginning to take form. And it is at this point that the enemy raises his head in a way that has not been seen. Follow with me, Acts 12 and verse 1. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Listen, if for one moment we thought that the advance of the kingdom of God was going to go unabated, 
we have another thing coming. Because this thing was stepping into realms of transformation that would affect the earth so profoundly that this is exactly where God had positioned his people to begin to touch. These are the dimensions of expansion that the government of God was beginning to express itself into new territory. And Herod, the king, listen, this is the conquest of kingdom versus kingdom. This is the clash of the kings of the earth, stirred by the prince of the air, to come against the citizens of the kingdom in their time of great expansion. The realm of the spirit was active. Peter has been activated. He has gone to testify the good news. He has gone to break the mold of that which is unclean. God has made clean. He's gone to establish the new order of the, the commandment of God. That this thing is not just for the Jews only. And at that moment, the king of the earth, Herod himself, stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James. This is Acts chapter 12, verse 2. The brother of John with the sword. And you know, I read this thing and so many things just begun to flood my spirit. What was the spiritual covering that this brother carried? James walked with the Lord. How is it that the king of the earth, Herod, could just rise up one day, stretch out his hand, and cause an apostle of God to be wiped off of the face of the earth just like that? So while the church is getting excited about expansion, the devil is excited about, he's excited about elimination and extinction. There's something that's taking place in the body of Christ at this juncture that the Lord had to call for a response to this craziness that was taking place. Then he killed James. Where's the authority of the church at this hour to, under to understand this, to see this attack from afar off? to intercept the, uh, the intent of the enemy? Could it be that the apostles could just be murdered by the sword and the church has no response? Could it be that the government of God and the earth could be threatened in this way and there is no equal response to address the same? Have we bought into a powerless kingdom that bears no authority? to represent the authority that Jesus left behind? Listen, the assassination of James would have put no small quandary in the hands of the apostles. This would have left no man settled in his, in his own bed at night. The intent of, the, of Herod was to harass, to frustrate, to completely bring to naught the advance which was imminent in the body of Christ. And in verse 3 it says, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, this man was doing this thing for sport. The life of an apostle that walked with Christ was entertainment value. It pleased the Jews. He proceeded further <laughs> to seize Peter also. I was like, wait, hold up. This is not the same guy that we just read about with the amazing exploit that was just in a trance. This is the same guy that God was talking to about expansion of the kingdom. So for one moment, Peter stepped into this thing and he thought, ah boy, God showed up. Global expansion is at our fingertips. Let's walk into it, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
And we think that the advance of the kingdom comes without a price. It comes by, oh, thank you, Lord. Name it and claim it. <laughs> and this lesson that I'm about to talk about is one that I want us to receive in our heart as being critical to understanding what God intends to do with his church. He saw that it pleased the Jews. This is Acts 12 verse 3. He proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, which is a time when, you know, we are actively involved in our spiritual duties and unleavened days of unleavened bread, you know, we are going about our ceremonial stuff and we are wonderfully um, um, engaging in our spiritual rituals and our activities. And that is the precise moment and it is the precise location that a Peter, an apostle of God, that walked with Christ, critical to the purposes of God, was just seized by Herod. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intend him to bring him before the people after the Passover. We're going to make a mockery out of this guy. We're going to take this guy. We're going to assassinate him. And exactly what we did to James, we will lift up our heads and we will declare that Herod the king is greater than the king that Peter serves. This Christ that Peter talks about. Let's establish the proper order of who's in charge here. This is kingdom versus kingdom taking place right here. This is the apostles of God. And by extension, the move of the spirit. And by extension, the leadership of the people that's being threatened. This is the sovereign grace that has been poured out for the body of Christ that is being threatened and imprisoned. There are graces across the planet right now that are locked up in chains. There are ravages across the body of Christ right now that the people of God, the graces that are intended to, to, to release a power to the body of Christ are in restriction even as we speak in this meeting. And this is where my presentation starts. As we seek to define the accurate functionality prescribed to the church, ecclesia, a body of citizens gathered to discuss the affairs of state, we must first call to attention the biblical identity and the role of the, of the called people of God in the earth. There is a specific role. And Peter was center to this role pivotal to this rule. He represented a part in the, the equation of governance that could not be overlooked. A body of citizens gathered to discuss the affairs of state. What is the function that was being established at this time that came under threat? There is a regulatory function, a dimension of governance, and an administration of power. Y'all remember the line, silver and gold have I none? As much as I have, give I thee. This same Peter administered the power of God to those that had need. An administration of power. That's one of the functions of the ecclesia that must be exacted to every domain, every sphere, and every jurisdiction to which respective houses have been directed. There is a critical function that's being threatened right in this scenario. 
a very, very critical function. The governance, the administration of power, the regulation that rests upon the shoulders of the apostles and the entire church at this time. The advance of that thing. Satan knew that if I let this thing get out of hand, the whole earth was going to see the glory of God. And as we gaze into the understanding that was at work in the early church in Jerusalem, the body of Christ in that location was simply described as the church with the evidence. Everybody say evidence. The evidence of God in their midst. The angelic visitation. The heavenly intervention into that which they were doing was no small matter. The religious order of the day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the established religious systems did not carry the evidence of God's governance in their midst. And it was this fledgling church, this embryonic stage, when Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom, this gospel shall be preached. And to preach means to, to declare, it means to proclaim, it means to literally show forth with evidence. Peter was such a man that bore the evidence and Herod knew it. <laughs> there would be no attack from Herod unless the evidence of God was rising in their midst. The realm of the spirit was activating this level of attack because this evidence could not continue and the name of the warfare was let me tell you who is in charge. There is a purity of functionality when we assemble with a single agenda. A corporate agenda. A unifying agenda. That we take corporate ownership of both administration and execution. The Jerusalem church did not operate in isolation to the other churches. There was an interconnectedness. When the need arose during the famine, that corporate agenda started to express itself. It was not something that was preached from a pulpit. It was something that was done practically. It was something that, that they saw needed to happen because the gospel that they were preaching was not a theory. It was the way in which they lived. The unifying agenda was something that could be seen by everyone that looked upon them, including Herod. Now here's what happened in Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. Here's what happened when the functionality, the single agenda, the corporate agenda and the unifying agenda takes place. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant, everybody say constant. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church, not the one person in the corner, not the pastors only, not the intercessory team. The, the, the consistency was made, was offered to God by the church, by the ecclesia, by the, the group that is called, called out once. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping. But when, but when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains and between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping in prison. Now behold. Let's go back to verse 5. But constant prayer. Partnership. The church. Single agenda. God, let's set Peter free. Cause your, cause your move to advance. Corporate agenda. God, release your, 
your servant that's bound in this season. Unifying agenda, everybody came together to say, let it not be what happened to James, oh God. Something began to shift. The church began to understand that they could rise up and say, not so. Not so. You can't just pick up on the apostles and decide to take them apart. You can't just stop the advance of the kingdom. And what God did is that he said, let me tell you something about who you call to be as a church, as a regulatory body. You call to stand together with each other and take up the administration and the execution of my purposes on the earth. You got to take the authority that I died for and you got to put this thing to work. Here's what Jesus said. The word of God says this so clearly. All authority has been given unto me. All. Somebody say all. All. And the church needed to realize that the authority that Christ purchased was resident within them. This persecution, this level of assassination was the most painful price that the church had to pay, had to pay to activate a level of corporate functionality in governing the affairs of the life of the move of God because Peter didn't just represent his own life. Peter represented the advance of the kingdom a senior level of leadership. He, re he represented the release of grace to the whole church. And the body of Christ realized that we ain't taking that. When Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains, between the two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him. And the light shone in the prison. And struck Peter in the side. And raised him up. Saying, arise quickly. Hallelujah. And the chains, guess what? Boom, gone. Somebody was praying. Somebody was standing in agreement. Somebody was walking in partnership. Somebody understood that their position in unison to the purposes of God, the intents of heaven, was that Peter needed to be set free. That the single agenda that lived in that meeting of prayer caused a response from heaven unlike anything that they had ever seen. All of a sudden, the church began to understand that the power didn't just sit with the apostles. The power rested in a corporate place of prayer, in agreement with the Spirit of God. Angels began to move. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself, tie on your sandals, and he did so. And, and he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Why there was Peter sleeping naked? I have no idea. So he went out and followed him. And he did not know what was done by the angel was for real, but thought that he was seeing a vision. And I believe that that's what's happening in the church today. Man, sometimes we see in things that's happening around us. And we still in disbelief. We still think it's an apparition, a vision. You still, still think that it's... But what Peter was about to step into and understand was that the partnership that was at work on his behalf, the fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous had availed his deliverance. The gathering in the books of Acts, chapter 12, verse 12, are we going to touch that? It represents something that is deliberate. This is where I want us to go. So he went in verse 9. 
he went out, followed him. And he did not know what, that he was gone by the angel, what was gone by the angel for real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate which leads into the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Listen, gates are going to open on its own. And I want us to remember that. That when the church begins to pray, gates are going to become open on its own. Angelic movements are going to take place. How many of us want to see angelic movements on behalf of our churches? On behalf of our ministries? How many of us want to see the support that God had assigned to us begin to be activated? Man, listen, I'm telling you, the angels are bored in this season. They want something to do. They have power and authority to, to affect life on earth, but they can't become activated until dimensions of partnership become released into our midst through clear sight, become led and articulated. And this is exactly where we are going. Peter had come to himself and he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. Listen, the guy wasn't conscious. And suddenly he realized, but wait a second. Chains fell off his hand. He passed through God's gate open. Went down the street. And it was only at that point. The consciousness that he should have had at the beginning, he received. Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel. And has delivered me from the hand of Herod. Hallelujah. And from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Enter Acts 12.12. 12. And the reason why this presentation is called Gate 24. Is because 12.4 is symbolic of 12 plus 12. I didn't even understand when I was preaching this the first time. That the Lord literally put at the center of governance, a principle that the church paid for with the blood of James. When he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary. Everybody say house of Mary. The mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Peter stepped into our house. A place that's a deliberate strategic configuration of like-minded leaders and saints. It wasn't people who just randomly rolled up. This is the house that the pain of James's death resided in. You could imagine the type of passion that was being prayed inside of this house. You know what a mother's love is for their child. And when you know that this woman said, listen, my child is dead. But you see, Peter, not so, Lord. Listen, these people gathered in this house was a statement of defiance to the realm of the spirit. It was an assembly of like-minded thought that said, we're going to begin to regulate this thing now. We're going to begin to behave like the ecclesia that we were called to be. We know that there was something delivered unto us. And you know what? Nothing is going to stop us now. We're going to pray until something happens. We're going to push the, the elements of darkness that want to stop the advance of the kingdom until the thing is shut down. They gathered and they began to pray. And the expression of partnership that was represented within that house, it was single-minded. It was single-minded. It was clear. This thing can't happen. And they gathered for the purpose of executing the mind and the will of the government of heaven upon the earth. They recognized that this was critical. They recognized that they had the authority to affect change. What happened in the house of Mary? 
was a collaborative movement. It was one house. Remember, it said earlier that the church prayed. The church prayed and Peter just stepped into one house and saw what that looked like. Peter left the prison and he went and he stepped right into what was birthed out of the pain, what was birthed out of the love for Peter's life. It was birthed out of blood that was shed. And I believe that in this day, that which was purchased in blood needs to be reactivated among the churches right now. It was a collaborative movement among the churches that gathered at certain locations that address kingdom and national matters in need of a heavenly breakthrough. Listen, Peter's life was on the line and heaven indeed responded with a breakthrough, with an intervention. When they gathered, they gathered and they could receive intervention. They could receive direction through prophetic prayer and intercession. Gate 24 for me, what I sense the Lord saying in this hour is that our partnership needs to become productive. We talk about the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And there is a collaborative emphasis that I believe that we need to step into right now in this season that would call us together strategically and systematically to begin to pray over assignments, to pray over initiatives, over leaders, to pray over situations, and to allow the grace of God to break through on behalf of his people. The power of the corporate engine. I want to just shift gears a little bit. And let's understand how these principles worked itself out in an amazing way, not just here, but all through scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 30, we know the scripture. I'm reading from the Amplified. How could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? Unless their rock, somebody say their rock, has sold them. And the Lord has surrendered them. As long as the Lord is in the midst of the battle, here's what the Lord says. Where two or three are gathered, I am in their midst. In other words, one could only chase a thousand, which means you have to be a mighty man. <laughs> But when two put 10,000 to fight, to flight, it means that the Lord in their midst begins to fight on their behalf. Two creates what I call a corporate engine that allows for a level of movement and a level of acceleration that goes beyond what happens with one person alone. And the church tapped into this dimension. In the house of Mary, they switched on that engine. And they caused heaven to move. And they called angels to descend. They caused breakthroughs to take place. Because they stood in a place that said, we could regulate the environment. We could regulate and dictate, determine the outcomes of that which concerns the Apostle Peter. From this scripture, we gain an understanding of exponential results associated with multiplied effect. Now, this is partnership in motion versus a singular effort. The word of God points us towards an increased effectiveness through accuracy and joining. How many of us want increased effectiveness? How many of us want to see dimensions of advancement and breakthrough? take place, you know, in a way that we have never seen before. Let's see the regulatory function return to the house through our prayer, 
in partnership with one another. Something happens when there's a single-minded vision that causes us to come together and say, listen, we are demanding exponential results. Who we are called to be. The biblical definition of church, when closely examined in Greek, is intrinsically in line with a political and national function and agenda, not a religious order or an ecclesiastical group. The Greek word ecclesia was deliberately chosen by Jesus in his day, while surrounded by Jewish zealots, Pharisees, and Sadducees. He could have identified his body as anything, but you know what he did? He said, in order for you to understand where I am going, what I'm building, I need a term that most accurately represents that which I'm doing. And this is where the word ecclesia was, was birthed. He spoke to his disciples and he gave insights as to heaven's agenda with deliberate strategic intent using the word ek, which means out of, and plesis, which is of calling. So Jesus treated them in a particular way. He treated them like an ecclesia. He literally handpicked and called out some. When did they were all uh, assembled as disciples, he chose for himself some to be apostles. And he created a system and a structure of their operation that represented an ecclesia, which in that day they understood was political and national in function. The word translated as should speaks to ecclesia. However, every true calling <coughs> implies one thing, a caller and a sender. To be called implies that you are called by someone and to have a calling <laughs> in order to execute it requires a sending. There's something about the dimension of what the church looks like in its purest function, that is a bunch of people that have identified themselves as being called by God. I want us to make no mistake about this. We, we, we're going back to the original intent of God in the issue of what's his church. We who are in Christ, and this is a mature crowd, this is not a, 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 a bunch of novices in this room, but I want to revisit the basics of the fact that we have been called and the only way we can execute our calling is if we get sent. Several implications occur. No one in the body of Christ is self-appointed. The illumination that we have that causes us to, to declare Jesus as Lord is because the Spirit of God has given us the ability to see Christ. Sight has been given by him. You can't appoint yourself. By nature, the way in which an ecclesia works is you have to be appointed. And by extension, an accurate church can't appoint itself or determine its own calling. You can't just wake up one morning and say, hey, I think I want to start a church. And I think I want to do this. And I think I want to do that. That's an inaccurate position from which Governance works. Governance doesn't work from, from originate from inside of your heart or, or inside of your good intentions. There's no true kingdom initiative if it's a kingdom initiative that's born out of your own creativity, that's born out of your own concern and love. Listen, everything that is of the kingdom is sent from the king. And there must be point three synchronization with the mandates of heaven and the word of God in order for a church or an ecclesia to be legitimate, empowered, and to produce the results expected by the kingdom of heaven. The key word right inside of here, synchronization, is the word that defines partnership with heaven and earth. Just as important is partnership one with another in this space is critically as important 
of our partnership with the agendas, the intents, and the, re and the responsibilities that are put on us by heaven. The church, therefore, represents those appointed to execute the commands and the instructions of the king. Jesus Christ himself. What is Jesus telling you to do? What has Jesus appointed you to do? If you have never understood this as part of your journey, spend some time at the end of this session calling out unto God. And we probably do some prayer after. Regarding what has the king appointed me to function in? How am I in partnership with the kingdom of heaven? Just as Peter was called to Jesus with a promise, so too in this time we have been called with assigned promises upon our lives, communities, and nations. There are promises that are assigned to each and every one of our lives. And it is my desire that that which God has intended for each and every one of our lives become realized, understood, accessed in this season. In an attempt to be built up together as a corporate governing arm in our nation slash region, there is a requirement for synergy among the leaders and the churches to uphold the singular purposes of the Lord over territories, over cities and nations. And thus we have been called collectively, say collectively, to administrate the affairs of heaven and earth. You know, we're really good at identifying that which God has commanded us to do as individuals. But have we identified, have we stepped into what God is doing among the churches? This is the very thing that was under threat when Peter was arrested. The among the church dimension, that is the thing that speaks to our unity. That is the thing that speaks to our corporate governance. That is the thing that speaks to us as a nation that's self-sustained under our King Jesus. That is the thing that showed the synergy among the leaders. When one set of leaders was dispatched in one area, to bring aid to, to others in another area. That is the representation, the season of our, an arising ecclesia that was working in partnership with each other that represented something that the earth had never seen. This is where the attack took place. And I want to talk about five Five dimensions here that we see in scripture that will speak to dimensions of partnership that I want us to, to identify as the, the real definers of what the corporate church is supposed to look like and function in. So number one is from singleness to interconnected functionality. And this is what God needs, a process that makes us interwoven. Here's what it says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Two are better than one. Because they have a more satisfying return for their labor. Hallelujah. More money. <laughs> We're talking about increase. If two of us work together, man, we can make more money. Listen, when Solomon was penning this stuff, this was not stuff that he didn't see the, the evidence of, you know. This was, this was amazing. This was at the end of it, something that was critical to move from singleness to an interconnected functionality meant 
a more satisfying return for your labor. For if either of them falls, the other one will lift up his companion. In other words, you have a buffer for time of weakness. But woe unto him is alone, for when he falls, he doesn't have anyone to lift him up. And again, if the two lie together, then they keep warm. But if one is, how can you be warm alone? And though one can overpower him, who's alone? But two, two could resist. One can attack from in front and one from behind. But here's the beauty in this scripture. A tree full, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And that is the principle of shared strength. The principle of shared strength is based on the scripture. If you take three strands and you plot it together, the strength of one cord becomes way more multiplied in strength when it's interwoven into the other two. And we're going to look at that principle with a little more depth. I'm going to take 15 minutes and then I'm going to close. Principle number two is many stones forming one house. The completeness of our definition requires the careful assembly into God's structure for his habitation where our connectivity is based on covenant. First Peter, here's what it says. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, corporate, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But here's the beauty in this. We are being built up into a spiritual house. God wants to inhabit a house, not a stone. His habitation needs us to be built up together to create a structure that he can inhabit. This is a critical understanding piece in why we need each other in order to be built up. There's a reason why there's a limited presence of God in our churches. Because the habitation of God needs more. <laughs> it needs people built together in order to create a habitation for the Lord. Our joint function in the hand of the Lord, fashioned by his process, when we are put together by his hand, we become operationalized and ready for function. I want us to look at this one. This is Jesus. Now, when the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers was doing business, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple. All out with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes of money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. But here's where this correction took place. When he had made a whip of cords. And I believe that this is the season when in the hand of the Lord, he is fastening individual strands of anointing and individual strands of graces. And he's, and he's making a whip in his hand. He is weaving us together. And through that partnership, through that interlocking, through that interconnected place, he could bring correction to the house of the Lord. He could bring order back to his temple. 
the correcting and reestablishing of the right order of the house of God. Prayer carries a regulatory function in the house of God. And here's what it says. He says, Jesus went into the temple. And after he drove them out, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold us, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And the house of prayer as the correct order is because his house is a governing house. And we cannot function in the sufficiency of what God wants us to do if the order of our focus is wrongly placed. Let's check this out. There's a reason why the house of God will be rendered ineffective if it becomes a marketplace. Earthly marketplace operations are primarily concerned with trade for personal enrichment. Prayer is concerned with a heavenly administration for the benefit of all. Listen, when the church begins to pray, rain going to fall on the just and the unjust. In every facet of life, it dethrones mammon and enthrones Jesus. It erases dependency on self and earthly strategy and lifts up God and his grace. It shifts the currency from silver and gold to faith and the power of the Holy Spirit. What is our currency in this time? Let me define money. Money is the resource that enables opportunities, control, influence, desires, intentions, and admiration. If money becomes the central focus by which we execute, we have missed partnership with God. A lot of us are seeking the resources to enable our opportunities, but we have not been seeking partnership with the Spirit of God in order to enable the, our outcomes. Love for this resource is the root of all evil. Prayer is focused on Jesus' agenda. Earthly trade is focused on secular agendas of men and empires, and it is often in opposition to the Lord. This is why Jesus had to drive this thing out of the temple. He had to reestablish the order of his house being a house of prayer. Coming to a close. Spiritual regulation for natural outcomes becomes the fifth function. The house of government must be assembled. Now for certain, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and he has rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all of the Jewish people. When he had realized what had happened, I pray even as we sit under the word today that we would realize what happens when we pray. That we would realize when our partnership is directed by the Spirit of God. That we will realize the authority of a shared operation. We'd realize the effectiveness that we have when we stand one with another. Acts 12 gives us an insight into the hostile environment within which the early church functioned. The assassination of the Apostle James signaled a wake up call, a period of no tolerance and a systematic establishment of governing prayer that would see that the life, the momentum, and the growth of the church would continue with everybody supernatural intervention. Heaven's protection and God's authority set within his house. In this house, the house of Mary in Acts 12, that represents to us a response to the attacks through spiritual regulation in prayer. But for us in 2022, it represents a pattern of not just responding to the adversity we have undergone, 
but becomes our seat of, watch this, preemptive administration and dominion for the intents of the kingdom in the earth on behalf of his people. And by extension, all people. The place that the ecclesia is required to operate in partnership one with another is preemptive in its nature. We are able to steward us away from adversity, to protect us from destruction, and to secure the purposes of God are transferred from one generation to another. This is the season to call together the whip, the living stones, and the house of governance from which the Lord dwells, as the Lord is calling us to partner together in prayer. And I close. Consistency is required. Fervency is required. Structure is required. Leadership and order are required. Resources are required. But most of all, somebody say partnership. Partnership is required. And the fruit of our labor is going to be guaranteed. Thank you for listening. Let me hand back over to Mark. That is it for me. Bless you all. Well, this is beautiful. This is rich. This is multi-layered. This is loaded. And um, Dave, first of all, thank you. Um, it is very obvious to me that um, there is something layered um, into your speech and beyond your speech, which we will have to um, lift our eyes to look at carefully. There are several things that you have said. Some of them have been captured here as quotes. Um, the latter ones, um, I don't think are ready, but let me just speak a couple of things from the bottom then. I'll just flip it open for everybody. Um, I am thinking in my mind, this teaching, though we'll post it on Facebook and YouTube. However, these teachings will be um, session into two because I see a whole complete two sessions in, in one presentation where the latter part we are dealing with the principles that gives way to real uh, kingdom partnership. And then the first part that described the entire realm of warfare and uh, the engagement that we needed to um, engage in and move in model for us in, through the Mary's house, the people gathered there to pray, um, not just prayer warriors, but the entire church went praying. So let me just put one or two things up here, quickly run through them. And then um, we will just open it up for everybody to just engage just quickly, quickly. Let me just do this. So here are some of the thoughts um, that have leaped off your presentation. The prayer that delivered Peter from, from the prison and death was not just a prayer offered by some people or prayer warriors, but by the entire church. And I think it's important. I have personally held the view, uh, this concept of prayer warriors and some group of people sitting. Uh, when you study the early church, everybody was praying. But there were some people who carried peculiar graces and prayed, but everybody was praying. And it is, it is sad that in our day we are prayer contractors, we have banished prayer to some special people when the entire church ought to pray. And Jesus's fundamental concept of church and the issues of decree and prayer clearly underscores the fact that it says, it says that whatsoever you bind, and it's spoken within a certain context, that uh, Peter said, you are the son of the I said, okay, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gate of Hades shall not uh, prevail. And I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you, not just a few of you. And then it leaps off into the following chapters where it speaks of where two um, are gathered. And two is representative of the whole. And so Christ is clearly speaking of the number of agreement, partnership, and, and the collective um, involvement of everybody and i think we if um 
if I'm a leader, I want to raise my, my church to be a praying church. Um, the group that I lead to be a, a praying group of people because that is how the kind of breakthrough they experienced in those days was ensured, even though God can still use one to um, do uh, so much. Let me just, the second one we see here um, is when the church begins to pray, gates are going to start opening on their own account. And angels release on our behalf. When the church, and you clearly see the word church is in quotation commas, when the church, when the church, when the church, when the church, something must shift in our concept. Um, another thing is the gathering of the church in the house of Mary was a statement of defiance to the realm of darkness and partnership with heaven. The, uh, we must take delight in provoking and allowing the spirit of God to provoke through as the gathering, that kind of gathering of Mary's house kind, that, that the house speaks of a community, speaks of the church. Our partnership needs to become productive. Very simple statement, but um, it should lead us thinking of what do we have to do? What adjustment, what repositioning do we have to engage to allow for this? There is a purity of functionality when we assemble with a single agenda, a corporate agenda, and a unifying agenda that we take corporate ownership of both administration and execution. There is purity of functionality. No one in the body of Christ is self appointed. And this statement is very explosive in my spirit because it has to underscore our partnership. If I understand that Dave was not, is uh, uh, not a man on his own, appointed by himself, that's the way I receive it. If I understand that Kelvin, um, let me see some of the names here. Um, if, if I understand that uh, Blessed, if I understand that Amazon, Albert, if I understand, that this person is uniquely placed in the place where he is and to function and express things in the way it's supposed to be. I will never, never for one moment want to make him or her over, but that I would allow myself to fit together with him like a calf stone, like a calf stone. That is what will allow the settling in. Dave, says something so powerful about why the power of God is lacking within our communities. I think this is fundamental. We see people um, through the lenses of our own minds and eyes as self-appointed. So I'm not connecting with him and I'll never connect with him. And uh, there's a song, it says, don't try to make me over now that you think you have me. Now that I think I have my brother, I shouldn't think of making him over. I should join with him and allow the grace of God that is upon me to rub on him and his grace rub on me so I can step into divine inheritance. An accurate church can't appoint itself and determine its own calling. Um, there must be synchronization with the mandate of heaven and the word of God in order for a church to be legitimate, empowered, and to produce the results expected by the kingdom of heaven. This is very, very big. This is very, very explosive. This is very, very profound. Okay, so um, let me just stop here. I'll come back before we leave. I quickly want to say, lastly, lastly, um, thinking about when the house, the church, the community becomes a marketplace, what does prayer look like? And what has prayer been? Has it been for that personal gain and personal satisfaction? As a result, we do not see the power of God. That, that reference re echoes itself in my mind in a certain way that there is a need that we begin to look at uh, prayer carefully. Today, I came across a simple video when um, some speaker, some man of God, some preacher was talking about how we, we do not live like God. Uh, we exist for God, 
we are created for his pleasure because the scripture says so, and that is his intent and purposes. But we think God exists for our pleasure. We want uh, the best kids. We want the best. Uh, uh, he even mentioned Tesla. God, give me Tesla. Give me this. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. But never do we leave to see that God, we exist for you, and we are supposed our life and every expression and everything we walk in. And every miracle we'll encounter, every single breakthrough that he gives to us is supposed to bring him pleasure. So I stop here. Um, it's open. Uh, who wants to jump into this uh, lake of um, beautiful creatures of the wisdom of God? Um, as you ready yourself, let me quickly say thank you for being on the call. And yet, uh, for me, uh, um, Blessed, uh, Shishu is here tonight, uh, Wisdom is here, Albert is there, Steven, and everyone, God bless you. So, uh, Kelvin, Kelvin Chambliss, God bless you, Amazon, God bless you. So, so open, it's open. Um, who wants to jump into this within the next few minutes before we go? Your thoughts, what did you hear? What provoked you? And what is tearing you up? Okay, um, let me see, let me see. Am I missing something here? I think I saw some, some. Okay, I see that. Come up, so please, go ahead. Hey, my friend Michael. Uh, I think Michael has dropped off. Sorry. Michael is a very, very great apostle. Oh, he's gone. He's a great apostle leading the new frontiers. Um, New Frontiers, uh, I think he's leading this, uh, uh, it's called Christ Centra, across the whole of, across the whole of, uh, I think, West Africa, Africa. That's Michael, he's a great friend, giving me access, in fact, uh, giving me endorsement, giving me approval, uh, giving me his pulpit, um, giving me his home, giving me food. Um, with great honor, acknowledging me being doing this. So she should go ahead. go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, uh, man of God, and thank you very much, um, Apostle David. I think that uh, the Apostle has spoken extensively. Please, am I clear enough? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Am I clear enough? Yes, you are. Go. Okay, so the Apostle has spoken extensively on um, synergy and partnership. <clears throat> Um, and effectiveness of, um, you know, uh, the fact that the synergy and partnership would be uh, the best way to uh, be more effective as far as kingdom, um, the kingdom business is concerned. But um, I think that we, I wanted to ask the question, what is the best approach? Because what's the best approach um, in the trueness and sincerity of heart, considering the fact that there is vast, there's a vast difference of doctrine and the interpretation of scripture, you know, um, because I believe that corporate prayer is already happening uh, to, to some extent, but the challenge really is um, the, the synergy of the various denominations where the challenge is also the interpretation and the difference in doctrines, you know. So how do we approach this partnership with the sincerity of heart? I don't know whether you're understanding my question. So because he spoke about partnership and synergy, and um, I think that uh, when it comes to corporate prayer, to a large extent, is 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 happening, but the challenge is um, the various denominations having that kind of partnership and synergy, uh, oneness of mind and all that to push the, um, the kingdom agenda. So how do we approach this um, partnership thing with a trueness and sincerity of heart, uh, considering the difference in doctrines and you know, the interpretation of scripture and all that? How, how do we approach it? Uh, you know, uh, how do we make it real? Uh, so I want to, Throw the question to um, the apostle again, if 
if that's okay. That was a great Hello, question. please. Am I? Am I? I was. Was I clear enough? <laughs> you are clear. You are clear. Perfectly. Okay. Yeah. I let's first say that um, one of the genuine evidences of a move of the spirit is that it is initiated by the spirit. Hello, Dave. You are a little I, muffled. Your voice is a little muffled. Okay. Um. One sec. Okay. Let me get it. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. So one of the things that I believe that whenever we are in the midst of what I would call a move of the spirit, this thing defies denomination. It defies um, personal preference. And a stirring that we get that is by the Spirit of the Lord to pray, to understand our, our role and our function, is one that we've actually seen in the history of the church over time. Whenever there's a, a corporate site of that which we need God's intervention from, that is the thing that breaks denominational time. When Peter was in prison, it didn't matter if you were believing that Jews only heard the word or Gentiles were available. What mattered was that Peter's life was on the line. And that was the point of agreement that caused heaven to move. If two of us shall touch agreeing concerning anything, that's where heaven begins to move. So I believe that as part of how we build Corporate prayer. I believe that training is a, is a necessary component. Uh, built into Gate 24 is training and retraining of prophetic prayer. And how it moves. The, the actual manual that goes alongside uh, Gate 24 is based on Psalm 24. Who can ascend into the holy hill? Him that has clean hands and a pure heart. And there are lots of things regarding teaching what constitutes effective prayer, a fervent prayer. Um, prayer that actually avails much. And along with that, there is the maturity of the believer and the understanding of the word of God. Listen, there are every different level of maturity that we could find in the church. There are babes, there are mature ones. But as leaders, when we come together and we hold the responsibility for activating the spirit of prayer within the church, it comes with a grace. It comes with hearts that are moved by the Spirit. It is not coercion by human effort to pray, but it's something that stood on the inside that you discern for yourself, that you recognize as every believer, the core function of our, of our salvation. It is in that scripture that says that my sheep hear my voice. Once we begin to tie in the basic function of all believers to access heaven, training, understanding how how that works, I believe that your prayer would be able to be effective and not just beat the air and accomplish nothing. I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, that, that's okay. Um, but you see, when it comes to, uh, there are certain things that when it comes to uh, that people can gather they, they, irrespective of uh, even faith. Because recently I saw on the CNN that the Muslims and the Christians have come together for a particular prayer. And we know that this has nothing to do with um, unity in the spirit or unity of faith. You know, so uh, when it comes to human life, people can gather and ensure that there is peace and all that and all that. What I'm talking about is um, unity in faith and in spirit, considering you know, the interpretation of scripture and the different uh, doctrines that we have. Um, I think we need to be sincere to the discussion that we are having. What's the, that's, so I was actually, what's the best approach? Because when it comes to human life, where I am, for example, we, we have a, a group 
that has Muslims in it, that, um, you know, people even who are worshiping um, other gods, like traditional people, part of the team, and we come together for the peace of the community. We come together for development and all that. But um, you, you will agree with me that that has nothing to do. And we come together sometimes to fight uh, violence. We come together to fight, um, you know, robbery and stuff like that. But it has nothing to do with the unity uh, of, of our spirit uh, as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. So I'm, I'm looking at how we can approach this, um, this discussion or conversation in, in, in its sincerity of heart that, you know, we are truly um, in, in that synergy or partnership to push uh, the agenda of God. Either than that, I think that there'll be some form of pretense, you know, in our approach, you know, and um, there'll be some form of- I think the key way that is messed with with the like-minded. Yeah. Like-minded. Okay. Like-minded with, like-minded with, like-mindedness is what is defined the nature of our faith. Okay. If we have an understanding of the routines of the kingdom, then we speak differently. We see things differently. We perceive mm. things according to what God is doing. Mm. If our salvation and our maturity has allowed us to understand that there is something called a kingdom agenda, yeah. then our prayer reflects a posture that is rooted in that understanding. So the first thing that I that I that I explained earlier has to do with like-minded things that we're gathering. In okay. other words, can't be effective if who you gathered with is not like-minded like you. Sure, sure, that's a good sure. That's a right? Sure, so a sure. Big part that has to do with the nature of our teaching, our training, our doctrine, as you rightfully uh, uh, identified. But I'm saying your assembling in order to join accurately should first be on the basis of understanding are we like-minded? Sure. Sure. And that's a process. It, it, it takes a process to work that stuff out and to know, and not just like-minded in in doctrine, but also like-minded in maturity. Mm. Now, some mm. of us may, mm. may be growing in the faith, and we need to to learn from those that are senior, that are that have been walking with God for years, and we can learn how to pray. So that was a pattern that we learned with Moses that was going up in the mountain. And Joshua followed him up. Joshua sure. did have the calibration of spirit. But by patterning mm. after seeing Moses function in his relationship with God, there's mm. something that got deposited within mm. Joshua's heart that created in him a capacity as a young man. Mm. And these dynamics of, 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 of maturity, of training, and of impartation are critical to how we actually cured uh, accurate prayer and moves of God that contain spiritual dimension. So I must say that like-mindedness is key and the systems mm. that facilitate like-mindedness, whether it is mentorship, training, whether it is um, uh, different programs that we put on to build a, a clarity of awareness. Programs like this certainly build a like-mindedness of, uh, of those that understand a kingdom position uh, in the ACC. It's something that happens when we submit the clear teaching and doctrine that allows us to function in the way that God calls us to be. So to me, like-mindedness is the key to know who to partner with and who not to partner with. Mm. Mm. Thank, you right. so, so, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you very much. That's beautiful. We have just about three minutes to go and um, we still have some window to get any other thoughts. Um, who is in for this? Uh, but you, you, you recall in the Bible, you take the time and look carefully at Acts chapter two, read it down to chapter five and see the expression of how things aren't legislated, but allowed to be under the governance of the Holy Spirit, creating a synergy in the spirit to allow um, momentum, uh, allow our prayer to gain momentum and impact. There is a spirit by which communities are built. 
Ecumenism is very different. Ecumenism is legislative. We try to put uh, uh, different kinds of fishes into the box, into the soup. But in um, under under community, under that expression of the spirit, the spirit, um, for want of better word, legislates. He inspires. He drives. One of them is called understanding. They've talked about like-mindedness. The other is shared life, where we begin to go beyond ourselves. Another I had mentioned earlier is looking through the lens of the spirit. If I am seeing you through the lens of the spirit. Another that David underscored that, that really pricks my heart seriously is imagine the marketplace, what is happening in the marketplace. We all could be selling a particular line of product. What is our objective? when we get into the marketplace. Imagine we enter into a prayer environment with such, such trust from the marketplace. We would not achieve effectiveness. So there is something that ultimately needs to be broken. There is prayer going on, there's corporate prayer going on all over the place. And uh, the more we pray, yes, we are achieving some level of results, but I believe that there is more that God wants to bring us into and something ought to shift in our hearts. Little by little, those of us hearing some of these things we need to begin to yield ourselves. And we need to pray. We need to pray for our communities and, re and ask God to release upon our communities the spirit and the grace by which communities are built, understanding, like-mindedness, shared life, um, that uh, uh, abandonment of marketplace self-principle, and we stepping into and coming to look for 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 the opportunity to bring gratitude to the, to the heart of God. I mean, God ultimately will bless us and give us everything, but I think the, the construct to which uh, some of the things have been done, almost like we want to we want to rob God, we uh, we are afraid you'll not give us, we we um, and sometimes we are genuine in our heart because we are in difficult spaces and also I think this is a very good discussion. So let's just allow for one more, one more, one more. Kevin Chablis, you have some thoughts? Amazad, you have some thoughts. Um, Kumi, you have any thoughts, uh, anything? Okay, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Kelvin. I, I do, uh, Mark. Thank you very much, Dave, for this uh, presentation. Uh, one of a number of things that that I saw here, but um, what I what I want to what I want to mention here is the the issue of what what Dave presented here. Uh, it's not optional. Uh, this really isn't optional. It, it, it's either we get a chance to live in God's design and his desire, or um, we suffer apart from it. And I, I just really feel that this was so compelling uh, tonight that uh, it's, it's worth listening to again and hearing God all over again inside of what was uh, presented here. So uh, those are my initial thoughts. I, I, I think that there, there still has to be uh, something going on um, uh, to, to be able to hash uh, these things out even more. Uh, but very quickly, um, uh, the issue of um, uh, the, the, the chaos and the sorrow and the loss of uh, James precipitating this, how he was able to be picked off and uh, something to be said about about that. So, I mean, just a whole lot more that needs to be unraveled, but I want to thank you again, Dave, for this, uh, this presentation here tonight. And again, uh, Mark, thank you for, for all as well. Thank you. All right. I think we may want to hold it here and, and say thank you. And then also quickly say that um, let's look out for uh, these recordings. It will be loaded into, if you're on the podcast platform, Overcast, Podbean, Anchor, Anchor FM, uh, Spotify. If you go to any of these platforms and you look for Hebrews and Man Became, you would find this recording hopefully before the before um, tomorrow afternoon. Um, if you go to YouTube and you look for Northgate Global, you look for uh, Basilia New Spheres, you look for Mark Abeku, you will still find this. And also on Facebook, we're going to upload this and cross-post it from Northgate Global 
to Mark Agbeko and then uh, Basilia Lucius. And so we want to say thank you. And think deeply as um, you go to bed tonight and some of us may be on our way to work, uh, depending on our location and some of you returning from work. Think about it. What does James represent within the equations of the purpose of God? What does Peter symbolize within the equation of the purpose of God? What does the house of Mary symbolize within God's equation and purpose? When our death becomes the point of entertainment and jubilation and celebration for the world, then you know something is deeply, deeply wrong. It is time that we begin to major on the major things. We begin to look at who Peter is and all of the appendages, the things that come with the expression of who Peter is and what uh, role it ha Peter has or this Peter dimension or James dimension has for the body of Christ so that we can truly pray and pray with great concern. There has to be a generation that cares for Zion, that really is passionate about Zion and it goes beyond our personal needs and our personal concern. And I want to say, God bless you. I want to just pray briefly and I want to ask God for a miracle for you, for somebody on this call. My hand touched something. I think my hand touched something and logged me, logged me off. Um, I just want to pray, Father. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for this first day. Thank you for Dave. Thank you for your hand and your protection over him. Thank you for the wisdom that you have dispensed to us. Lord, we have asked you in prayer that let not these meetings be one of those meetings we attend, but let it be a meeting that provoke us deeply and that transport us into the very place and location in you. Lord, there are men and women on this call with various needs and various capacities. You are God whose providence has brought us where we are. We ask for a miracle for everybody, healing miracle, financial miracle. We ask that you will open doors. As I lift my voice to pray, let it be the church in this space praying let doors open on their own accord. Let angels be released for interventions on our behalf. Father, let it be said that when we heard your word and we just put it into practice, something happened in our world. Thank you for the stirring our spirit. Thank you for an awakening. Thank you for your revelation. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.